and hello, Westwood Hills Christian Church. We will start today's worship by taking scripture from 1 Corinthians 15, 3 to 6. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. You've just heard today's scripture reading, and now we turn our service over to our guest speaker today, Dr. Robbie Phillips of Hope International University, located in Fullerton, California. Dr. Phillips. Good morning, Westwood Hills Church. I'm so honored to get to bring a message from God's Word to you this morning. I listened to Pastor Joe's message last Sunday on Easter Sunday, and it was so encouraging. I, I want to talk about a similar theme this morning. I want to talk about how do we live post-Easter? How do we live in light of the resurrection? How do we live um, in view of the reality of the resurrection? There's this uh, interesting play that was written during the 1950s, and it's a play that is about the actual historical uh, persecution of the church by Roman emperors. And in this play, there's this uh, scene where the Roman emperor is going through the catacombs. That's the caves that the Christians would hide in to avoid persecution. And he's got his soldiers with him, and he's looking to find Christians to persecute them. And he comes across Lazarus. Now, if you don't know, Lazarus is Mary and Martha's brother uh, and friend of Jesus, and he's the one who passed away uh, in the gospel. And Mary and Martha longed for Jesus to come, and when he arrives, they're, they're sad. They're, if you had been here, he, he might not have passed away. And Jesus says, uh, those famous words, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, the, he who believes in me, the one who believes in me, though they die, they will live. And then he goes to the tomb of Lazarus and says, Lazarus, come forth. And he resurrects Lazarus from the dead. It's this beautiful and amazing passage in the gospel. And so the creative writers of this play about persecution uh, in this scene, the emperor with his guards is looking for Christians in the catacombs and he comes across Lazarus and he becomes furious with Lazarus because Lazarus shows no fear. And the emperor says, don't you know who I am? Don't you know that I could have you killed? You know, he's got his soldiers with him. He's ready to really teach Lazarus this lesson. And Lazarus looks at him and laughs. <laughs> and it just makes the emperor so furious. He says, how can you do this? Don't you know who I am? And Lazarus says to the emperor, haven't you heard? Haven't you heard? Death is dead. It's such a, a beautiful line and such a beautiful moment and kind of this window on what it means to live with confidence in the resurrection, this post-Easter life, uh, this confidence and faith in the reality of the resurrection that obviously Lazarus would have. And you and I are called to have that same confidence uh, in Easter, that same confidence in the resurrection, and to live out of that confidence. I, I want to kind of try to build up our confidence in the resurrection this morning. I want to share five truths um, that show us the reality of the resurrection. Uh, one scholar has arranged these in five E's, and I want to share those five E's. Now, admittedly, this sermon is a little more professor-like professor than I would normally preach. I was a pastor for 30 years. Uh, back east, uh, preaching every Sunday, and then uh, came here about 18 months ago to take on the role of professor. So I certainly know preaching, um, and so I confess this sermon is a little more uh, of a professor uh, E type sermon, but uh, I hope it's an encouragement to our heart because it builds my faith to see this evidence uh, for the resurrection itself. Uh, one uh, is the execution of Christ. Christ. 
Uh, his execution was real and authentic. He died on the cross. I say that because some scholars through the centuries have offered the suggestion that maybe he didn't die. Maybe he just passed out and then woke up in the coolness of uh, the grave. Or maybe he was given a drug that caused him to pass out and then wake up later. And that still can be popular uh, on some state university classes on religion and some podcast and on the internet. But the truth is that idea has been discredited. No credible scholar believes that any longer because there's so many facts. We know about Jesus' death on the cross from scripture and from outside of scripture in other historical sources. We know that the Romans were professional executioners. No one came down off the cross alive because the Romans invented crucifixion to send this message to any who would dare stand against the Roman Empire. The word the uh, excruciating came uh, into existence, in, in, invented to describe the pain of crucifixion that the Romans invented. Um, and they would flog their victims oftentimes before they crucified them uh, just to ensure that crucifixion would kill them. And Jesus, we know, is flogged 39 times. Flogging is this beating with a whip that has bone and stone and glass tied into it so that it tears the skin. One eyewitness in history to a flogging said that the, that the veins and the arteries and the very organs themselves were laid bare in the flogging. And we know that Jesus couldn't even carry his own beam, his own cross, and someone had to be pulled out of the crowd uh, to carry his cross for him because of the flogging. And we know historically, and it's recorded in the Gospels uh, in addition, that the Roman guards would often come and break the legs of those that they were crucifying just to speed up death. Because the actual cause of death in many crucifixions was asphyxiation, the inability to breathe any longer because of the position of being strapped uh, to that cross, nailed to that cross. They couldn't breathe. They'd push themselves up to get a breath and then lower themselves down. And so when the legs were broken, they could no longer push themselves up. And we know in Scripture that they came along and broke the legs of the two thieves. And when they came to Christ, he was already dead. But being good Roman executioners and knowing their job was on the line and their own heads were probably on the line, uh, they made sure, triple sure that he was dead by shoving a spear up under his rib into his sides, we're told. And we're told that they saw water and blood come out. Uh, medical uh, knowledge tells us today that that likely indicates a piercing of the sack around the heart, which would release both water and blood. As a matter of fact, uh, the Journal of American Medical Society did a study on the crucifixion and they concluded this. The author wrote, clearly, the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was dead even before the wound to his side was inflicted. Interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. As I said, no scholar believes the swoon theory, as it's called by some. Jesus was tortured and died on the cross. He was executed by the Romans. The second evidence is the early accounts of the resurrection itself. They come so early in the life of the church. And it's another counter to kind of a false narrative that will fly sometimes on television, on state university campuses, as I said, on podcasts and the internet, that somehow the Christians, the early church, invented the idea that Christ was divine, that he resurrected from the grave. They made that up. It's a legend that the church created. But the reality is scholars acknowledge that legends take about 70 years to form because everyone who could be a witness to counter the legend must pass away. And so it takes many decades for a legend to uh, occur and be created this way. And what's interesting is one of the oldest portions of the New Testament that we have it is a little manuscript uh, of 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8. And I just want to read a portion of that. Um, this manuscript is dated 24 to 36 months from the life of Christ. Think about that, 24 to 36 months 
from the life of Christ. So close to the original event, no time for a legend to develop. And if it's written down, it's because for many months prior to that, it was preached orally. From the very beginning, it was preached orally. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. The resurrection is testified in the earliest manuscripts, the earliest parchments we have of the New Testament. Paul goes on to say that over there were over 500 witnesses to the resurrected Christ. Over a 40-day period, he appeared to over 500 people. It's an amazing testimony, these early witnesses, these early accounts of the resurrection. Paul even says in this passage in Corinthians 15 that uh, some of those witnesses are still alive, which is his way of saying, go check it out. If you don't believe this amazing story of the resurrection, he appeared to over 500 people, many of whom are still alive, meaning you can go ask them. You can go check with these eyewitnesses. Third, the empty tomb. Uh, is such a solid evidence for the resurrection of Christ. What's interesting, too, about the empty tomb is the first witnesses of the gospel, the first people to come and say, the tomb is empty, Christ has risen, were women. Now, what's interesting about that is in the first century culture in Rome and also in Judaism, uh, in Roman culture and Jewish culture, women were not considered reliable witnesses. They weren't allowed to sign documents. They weren't allowed to be a part of government procedures as a witness. They weren't allowed to testify in court because they were considered untrustworthy witnesses. So the crazy idea that the church invented Jesus' divinity and his resurrection, if the church was inventing this idea, they would have never chosen women as the first witnesses. They would have never said, let's make this up and let's have the first witnesses be women. They would have made the first witnesses Pharisees or key disciples or prominent people in the culture if they're making it up. The reason they tell us in the gospel passages that women were the first witnesses of the gospel, the first witnesses of the reality that Christ resurrected, is because that's what happened. That's what you do when something miraculous happens. You report it. You don't feel any permission to edit it. You're overwhelmed by the magnitude of it. All we know is we were hiding and the women went to the tomb and came rushing back, said, it's empty. The tomb is empty and Christ is, is resurrected. And he said to us, go tell the disciples and he's going to meet us. And we know how the rest of those resurrection appearances unfold in the Gospels. That's part of the credibility of the Gospels themselves, part of the credibility of the reality of the resurrection, this empty tomb testified uh, to by women. Um, some say, well, some, maybe the tomb was empty because the body was stolen. But who would have stolen the body? Uh, the Romans would have no interest in stealing the body. if they, they would have produced the body if there was a body to have ended the conflict and this little sect uh, in the great Roman Empire. The Jews, if they could have, if there was a body for them to get, if the tomb wasn't empty and they could have gotten the body, they would have produced the body to say, here's your Messiah. Now quit this stuff and stay with Judaism. They would have not wanted this little sect to have grown. They would have produced the body, but a body is never produced. As a matter of fact, no critic of Christianity in the first century ever suggests that there was a body uh, ever refutes the empty tomb because it was empty, because it was empty. That's part of the reality of the resurrection, this empty tomb. Chuck Colson, if you know that name, he was uh, President Nixon's right-hand man, and he was in the Watergate scandal and ended up going to prison. And in that season, he ended up converting. He read C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, which is an awesome book. And he gave his life to Christ and came out of prison and started prison fellowship ministry. And for decades did beautiful ministry in the name of Christ to those who were prisoners. But he shared about his experience being part of that inner circle of President Nixon, all of whom ended up going to prison in one form or another because of the water gate scandal, if they could have kept their mouth shut, uh, they could have all avoided prison. And he said that experience taught him the reality of the resurrection. Here's what he said. He says, I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified 
They had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would, ha would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12, embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me that 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. The resurrection is a reality, and the empty tomb testifies to that reality. In addition, eyewitness testimony, the fourth E in our five E's, eyewitness testimony uh, supports the resurrection. As we said, over a 40-day period, over 500 people saw the resurrected Christ. Oh, uh, 515 different individuals, men, women, adults, children, doubters, believers, all these different categories. If these 515 people were brought into a courtroom and allowed to give their testimony, their eyewitness testimony for 15 minutes each. It would be 128 hours of testimony. Who of us could sit in a courtroom and hear 128 hours of eyewitness testimony and say, I don't believe it happened? None of us could. So much testimony, so many eyewitnesses pointing to the reality of Christ. And some might say, well, maybe it was a hallucination that these witnesses saw Jesus, but that's not how hallucinations work. Uh, it, they don't work with uh, 500 different people over 40 different days in all these different locations. Hallucinations, it'd be like me saying to you, uh, how did you like the dream I had last night? And you would say, well, that doesn't make sense. Uh, and hallucinations don't transfer across people over multiple days in multiple locations. The same thing is true when somebody says, well, maybe it was groupthink. Again, groupthink doesn't affect multiple people over different days, 40 different days, different locations. And, and we're told that Jesus ate uh, with others and that he cooked fish for the disciples. And that one disciple who was a doubter, uh, he said, put your, your fingers in the holes in my hand and put your hand in the wound in my side. That's not a hallucination. Uh, that physical reality of Christ's resurrection. And even if you buy into some of those ideas, you still have to answer the question, where is the body? Because one was never produced. And like I said, even the critics of Christianity in the first century never refuted the missing body, the empty tomb. And fifth and last, the expansion of the church points to the reality of the resurrection because we move from Peter being this disciple who scuffs his feet and looks down and cusses in order not to be associated with Jesus during Jesus' trial because of fear. We move from that Peter to the one just a few days later who's preaching boldly, this Christ whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and King. He preaches that boldly to thousands, to this crowd, without any hesitation. And the difference in those few days is the resurrection. It's the reality of the resurrection. You know, some critics might say, well, maybe the disciples were religious fanatics. That's what it was. But when you think it through, you realize they don't fit in that category. A religious fanatic is somebody who doesn't have firsthand knowledge uh, they're told something and they believe it undiscerningly and then they act on it undiscerningly. But the disciples, they were in the unique position to know, to know whether or not Christ resurrected. They knew whether it was true or not. And as Colson mentioned, they would not have allowed themselves to be tortured and go to prison for something they knew to be a lie. They knew it to be true and that's why they kept that message the whole time of preaching Christ's resurrection. There's this um, beautiful three book series by J.R.R. Tolkien, uh, who was a friend of C.S. Lewis's, and he wrote this three volume book series and called The Lord of the Rings. You may have read it. You may have seen the movies that were made from it. It's this epic uh, three novel series about orgs and wizards and hobbits, and it's all about the battle of good versus evil. It's a fantastic series, and the movies are well done, fun to watch if you like those sorts of epic battles. And there's this hobbit named Sam 
uh, in all three books, who's got a good heart and believes in God, who believes in good and is fighting for the good. And there's this wizard named Gandalf, who is a good wizard, who's fighting on their side through the novels, but then he is killed. And there's this scene in the final no novel, in this final battle, when good is starting to win the battle. And Sam looks over and sees the wizard Gandalf fighting alongside him. And here's how the author words that moment. Uh, it says, but Sam lay back and stared with open mouth. And for a moment between bewilderment and great joy, he could not answer. At last, at last, uh, he gasped, Gandalf, I, I thought you were dead, but then I, I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Such a beautiful line. What's happened to the world, he says. A great shadow has departed, said Gandalf. A great shadow has departed. And then he laughed. He laughed with the sound that was like music or water in a parched land. There's that beautiful laugh again, like Lazarus at the beginning, that laugh of knowing that death is dead. Our death is dead. If we have our faith in Christ, if we believe in the resurrection, just like Jesus said to Lazarus in John 11, he is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in him Though we die, we'll still live. We will resurrect one day with Christ to know him, to live with him, to live on the new heaven and the new earth. Because of that truth, we know that this lifetime is not all there is. It's just a tiny piece of eternity itself. This life is just this sliver of eternity. And so we don't have to live out of fear for this little lifetime. We don't have to make bad decisions and treat others poorly and be in competition and grab all the gusto and grab and compete and belittle and all the things that we're tempted to do because we want our prestige, our power, our ego. We're afraid of death. We fight death. We try to look young. We try to stay young. We try to do everything we can sometimes out of this fear and we're called not to live out of fear, but to live out of faith in the reality of the resurrection. To know that because of the work of God through Christ on the cross, and because of the resurrection, everything Christ preached and promised is true. As, as, as the hobbit Sam said, everything sad is going to come untrue because of the reality of the resurrection of Christ. Let us pray together. Loving Heavenly Father Jehovah, how can I, we, begin our prayer unto you without first saying thank you? We, your children, are charged with being the embodiment, the representation of the New Testament, namely, to represent love. Send us out. Send us forward, Father, to be successful in being individual lights in a darkened world. Divinely bless us, please, to press on, giving us continuous, utter confidence in you, Master. May we influence others positively, practically, and beautifully. You, Father, receive all praise and all glory. This loving prayer is offered to you, Master, in the name, yet also in the resurrecting power of your precious and holy Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, family, that concludes our worship service for this gloriously beautiful Lord's Day. Please take care, be safe, be blessed.